Um, hi, um, I'm Maria Mestre. Thanks for having me. Um, so a bit about my background. Uh, I did a PhD many years ago uh, working with biomedical signals. Uh, and then I moved to industry where I worked as a data scientist for more than 10 years um, in different companies across different domains. And recently I started a company with my co-founder Stuart where we're building an annotation tool for text and it uses weak supervision. It's called Data QA. Uh, it has an open source library, so we'll be talking about the open source uh, app today. Um, so let's just share. Uh, so yeah, I will be talking about data enabling with weak supervision. Um, so I'm sure you've heard about it already data-centric AI, so it's the new catchphrase that everybody's talking about. Um, and I think um, we hear more and more about it and you know, uh, important sort of voices in the community are also uh, mentioning it. Um, and I think it's basically because there's been a recent shift in the focus from the community where people um, are less, you know, talking less about improvements of, of you know, model architectures. Uh, and more about the, um, you know, uh, the impact that data has on machine learning uh, for machine learning. And I think the reason for this is because um, uh, AI has, you know, slowly moving, or I would say has moved from academia into the in industry. Um, and now we're seeing it on, you know, uh, it has reached a state of maturity where we're seeing it uh, used successfully for many different applications. Um, and people are starting to realize that, uh, you know, you cannot, the, you cannot have a successful ML project if you don't have high quality data. And very often, if you're trying to improve a machine learning model, uh, you will get higher gains from improving your data rather than improving the model architecture. Uh, so yeah, just put a few examples of tweets, um, of people discussing this. Uh, last year, there was a survey uh, organized by O'Reilly's where, uh, where they were talking to companies uh, that had deployed AI or were planning to deploy AI. And uh, one of the main questions was, uh, what were the top challenges today in adopting AI? Uh, and the two main challenges were, uh, well, struggling to hire the right skill set um, and also getting the right data, like um, lack of data or data quality issues. Uh, and I would even argue that these uh, two issues are sometimes even linked because um, what we see is uh, very often the data scientist at a company is also in charge of creating the training data and might end up doing some annotation. So spending a lot of time doing something that might be better uh, you know, done by a domain expert rather than the data scientist. And so one last piece of evidence that a data centric AI is here to stay. So Stanford released a, a report uh, recently um, with you know trends in the industry, uh, and one of the main takeaways was that um, some of the benchmarks and state of the art results that were achieved uh, this previous year were mainly due to more data, getting more data uh, rather than improvements on the model or the model architecture. So with this, let me talk now about, oh, why is it so hard to get label data, right? Uh, well, labeling is difficult. So depending also on the application, um, it, there might be some intrinsic ambiguity so that you know, multiple people looking at the same data, they might uh, come up with different labels. Um, so you know, most label data sets have errors. Um, and I think many companies, they don't even try to, uh, you know, to assess the label, uh, the level of error they have, uh, which I would say is, is a mistake. Uh, you know, every time you have a label data set, you should understand um, what are the errors that you are, you're introducing. Um, and yeah, there was a study last year um, about, about this. So um, it's a paper called Pervasive Label Errors in Test Sets. The stabilized machine learning benchmarks. So in this paper, they looked at some uh, data sets that were used for some very you know, famous uh, competitions uh, in AI. And they estimated the level of label error. Um, and for example, ImageNet 
they estimated around 6% label error. Um, they even have a website, which you can, it's kind of fun. So they create this labelerrors.com and you can inspect the different you know, data sets and you will see some of the examples of errors that you can find. Um, yeah, so labeling data is hard. And on top of this, it's a manual error. So sorry, it's a manual uh, labor. So it's hard to scale because you need you know, that person looking at the data. Now, this is where Wix supervision is, uh, is quite interesting. So in a, in a very simplified process, like labeling process, you will have a, an annotator look at a bunch of documents sequentially and labeling each document one after the other. So it's a linear process, it's non-scalable. You might still end up with a, you know, uh, some errors at the end, even if a person has checked all the documents. Uh, and there's also, if there's a change of label definition or in the taxonomy, um, then you might need to start over. And um, so it's quite labor intensive. And the only knowledge you get from your annotator is really those little units of, um, of knowledge, which uh, you know, every time he labels one document, you get a little bit of information about the problem. Uh, but you know, it's very, very linear, very um, slow process. And um, so this is why I want to explain to you now how you would do this with Wix supervision. So Wix supervision um, is a way to combine uh, like other data sources um, together. So in this case, the annotator, the annotator, if you know if they're a domain expert and they know their data, they will know things about your data. And this, you know, with Wix supervision, they're able to encode that knowledge uh, in a way that uh, your machine learning model can also use that knowledge. So things like, for example, if there are external data sources or knowledge bases that are similar to your problem space, uh, you might be able to use them um, you know, to pre-annotate your documents. Um, you, might, you might be able to use simple explainable rules. Uh, so rules about the, the structure of the, the document, rules about syntax, um, words that you expect to see, whether there's you know, lots of all caps, um, punctuation, so all sorts of things you can, um, you can find you can do, uh, and then you can also combine machine learning models, uh, which you might have trained on a different domain or you know slightly different uh, data domain uh, data source, and uh, you can also use those to pre-annotate your text. And the idea is that so your annotator will not only give you labels for specific documents; they will also give you uh, information about the problem. You know, in in the in the uh, format of rules, for example. Uh, and then they will label the documents in a way that you can learn which of these rules work best. So you might learn, for example, that uh, certain knowledge bases work really well for certain classes, or that uh, for specific documents uh, with different you know, specific structures, there's a rule that works really well. Or that um, if you combine, you know, assemble mod, you do an ensemble model. You have different weak models. You learn um, that they work really well if one of them agrees with the another one, for example. So it's a way of you you get your annotator to give you some domain knowledge um, in the in the form of rules. Then you add some machine learning layer to understand which rules work well, and then finally you can automatically pre-annotate text, um, you know, with a high level of accuracy. And a way to, to summarize this is, so in a no machine learning setting where a person is looking at one document at a time, um, you know, for zero effort, you have zero labels and for max effort, you have 100% uh, label coverage, right, for your documents. But um, if now you add machine learning or machine learning with weak supervision, so there are different ways that you can use machine learning here, uh, but you can achieve a high, higher level of accuracy with much less um, effort. And you might, depending on the problem, you might decide that you know 80% accuracy, 90% accuracy is enough for your labels, or you might want to have 100% accuracy, but using these techniques will still speed up you know, um, the labeling effort significantly. 
So let me now show you an example. So uh, DataQ is an open source tool. Um, it is written in Python. Uh, the back end is Python. The front end is React. Um, it combines uh, so a library called Snorkel, which uh, which is for programmatic labeling, uh, quite popular library. Um, so it's built on top of Snorkel. Um, it's built on top of Spacey. Um, so it's you know a rule engine which uses regular expressions, which you can apply either on the, on the full text or on spacey tokens. Um, it also ships with a text search engine with Elasticsearch. And right now um, you can do multi-class classification, named entity recognition or named entity disambiguation. Uh, and it runs locally. Okay, so you install it with a pip, pip install. Um, so it's a fairly new project still, and we're still learning what works, what doesn't, um, but we're really keen on getting feedback from the community, which is one of the main reasons why I'm presenting today. Um, so yeah, you can head to the, if you head to the repository, you will see, uh, you will see different, um, different ways. Uh, yeah, so how to install it. You can either install with pip, uh, or you can install it with um, run a Docker instead of, Keep installed, so there are different ways you can you can install it. Okay, so now let me show you an example um, of what I mean by weak weak labeling. So I will show you an example with of a classification project. So here I have um, three thousand products from Amazon, and I'm trying to. So these are my product description and I'm trying to uh, annotate them or assign them a class a product product category out of 24. In this case, for example, this is talking about a sandal. This would be clothes, uh, clothing, shoes and jewelry. OK, so data queue has a search engine. You can search you know, specific words, say I'm um, interested in looking at all the products that have sandal in them. And then you can also label from the interface. So, you know, this just label this a sandal, this is sandal. So it's a way to quickly generate labels for specific classes, um, especially if, if you have an imbalanced data set, this works really well because you might, you might find a way to label the minority class using a search. Uh, and then you can add rules. So I'm gonna show you some examples of rules first that you can, you can use so this is again in the documentation you have some examples of rules you can use so you have a uh, regular expressions um, which you can apply on the whole text you can apply on tokens um, you can also apply them on entities so these are spacey entities so let's say for example you want to detect all the organizations that match this regular expression so they have american in them so you will you know american cancer society for example, would be a match. Um, and then you can also create rules that uh, take into account the order of uh, the, the matches. So you might say, for example, I, will, I want to match any document that talks about the economy. So that has a sentence with a word, you know, starting with this regular expression, economy, and it's followed by a downturn of growth. So to match, you know, all these specific sentences, the economy has taken a new downturn. Um, or if you want to do claim detection, you might want to say, I want to add any document that have the name of a person. So any person followed by say or claim in the same sentence. So here you would be able to match all the sentences that have this uh, kind of structure. So in our case, um, we will create a very simple rule, which says, I'm going to copy, this is from the tutorial. Um, very simple, which says I'm going to match any document. So if the text contains this regular expression, so the regular expression is uh, if it contains the word book or author or novel or guide, then I'm going to assign the label book. So, and the idea here is that uh, these rules if they have a high level of accuracy of precision, then um, you know it's a way to pre-annotate your, your documents. And that way you can, when you're manually reviewing them, you should be able to go much faster. Uh, so it covered 416 uh, product descriptions. And 
So we can see that you know this one is correct. So we say, yeah, correct, 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 correct. Uh, and this way you annotate much faster than having to you know search the 24 categories. Uh, and once we add, we're thinking of adding keyboard shortcuts, then you know th things should even go much faster than this. So this is a quick example now. I'm going to show you, let's say that you know, I've done this and that I've created many rules. So um, this is the same project, the same data, but now I have you know created 32 rules, okay, um, to try to have as much coverage as possible. Um, and so my coverage here is, uh, uh, you know, around 2,000 documents out of 3,000. So two thirds of my documents are now covered by rules. Um, so again, these rules are very simple to come up with because they're just words. Um, so you, you know, you don't need to be uh, an expert. Uh, I mean, you just need to understand the data to be able to come up with them. Um, and so I'm gonna now show you. So this is a notebook that you can also look at. It's in this repository. Did I create notebooks? Um, and I, here uh, I run some experiments. I'm not gonna show you this every cell. Um, there's a lot of code in here, but I'm just gonna focus on this, on this plot. So what I did was, um, let's say I had two data sets, a training data set, which I used to create my rules and a test data set, which I didn't look at, you know, with complete unseen data. Um, so I use, um, I'm, here I'm comparing what's the typical approach. The typical approach is you label some documents in your training data set, you uh, train a model, and then you go and use that model on the test data set to you know, get some accuracy. Um, and so that's typical approach. Um, so here, whenever I say, so ML random manual N, so N is the number of manual labels I did on the training data set, and this is the accuracy I got on my test set. And this bar here shows you, okay, what if um, now I used a combination of my manual labels as well as the rules? So my training data set now will be much bigger. It will have a combination of noisy labels as well as uh, manual labels. Uh, and what we've seen for this particular data set is that um, there's a, significance, a significant improvement in performance with the same amount of effort in labeling. Um, and I think there are some studies, I haven't linked to the papers, but um, this is, you know, weak supervision does work very well uh, uh, across many applications, because the idea is that um, you give, you give uh, more data to your model and your model and your model is able to understand which, which are the patterns that work well and which ones, which ones are the ones that don't work well uh, based on, you know, the accuracy of each rule. Um, so yeah, this is for classification. Now I can also show you, sorry, I can also show you an example with name and entity recognition. So in this case, um, okay, so my data is, I have a thousand forum posts. So let me show you the data first. Um, so these are, uh, it's user generated content and these are people posting in a forum talking about side effects of drugs, okay? And what I'm trying to do here is label all the side effects that I find, okay? So my class is a side effect. Um, and in terms of rules we can apply here, I'm gonna show you some, some examples. The rules that we support are, uh, we can have regular expressions on the entities, if you have like a vocabulary list, so this would be, you know, you could use this. Um, you can tag an entity that appears after specific words. So if you say, if, you know, I want to tag anything that comes after married to, so Obama is married to Michelle Obama, so you would match that. You can match on phrases. So say, uh, I want to tag all the phrases in documents that have the word ingredients, say like for recipes, um, or I want to tag any noun phrase that matches a list of symptoms. And in this case, it won't just match the, you know, say um, headache or cramp, it will match the entire noun phrase. So if you have a sentence, I have experienced mild headaches, it will match the whole noun phrase, mild headache. So let's just run it over our data. Um, so I'm gonna just copy paste from the tutorial. Because that way I don't need to type. 
so say I have this, you know, a list of side effects that are pretty common, like headache, nausea, weight gain, dizziness, insomnia. So this is my regular expression. I'm going to go my data and I'm going to say, I'm going to create a rule, regex match on the entity. And I'm going to say, this is my list of side effects. And I want to give it the class side effects. Okay, so side effect uh, word list. And I'm going to create my rule. So what I see is uh, it found, um, you know, 220 documents with these uh, with matches. So I can go and then label them, see how, how well it works. So it says, uh, this sentence says, the only side effect I've ever had was a bad headache. Okay, so this is correct. I did not experience weight gain or any abnormal side effect. That is incorrect. So we can remove it. Um, you know, I became, again, so this sentence would have some missed, I mean, the rule would not be able to catch everything but it did catch nauseated and I, and I found a sentence that has a bunch of side effects. So, you know, you can then label the missing side effects. Okay, so that is an example of using rules for uh, name entity recognition. Um, and at the end, if you go back to the summary table, you can see, um, you know, after you've labeled some examples, you can see what's the accuracy um, and you can go uh, on this tab, estimated performance, it will give you the performance over the entire class across all the rules that you create. In this case, the precision is around 67%. And if you label even more documents, it will give you also a range, like a confidence interval. Um, so I think I have time for to also show you symptom mapping. So this is named entity disambiguation. Um, so here, Let's say that I have mapped, so I have extracted phrases with all the symptoms. But now I, I have a taxonomy of symptoms, um, and I would like to map it to this taxonomy, okay? Um, because people might say, I have a headache or I have a migraine, and you might want to map those two mentions to the same knowledge base, to, to the same entry in your taxonomy, which would maybe called headache and migraines, I don't know, just to come up with it. So here I have, um, I have around 7,000 you know, side effects in my taxonomy. Um, and I've got you know, 50, uh, 57 documents or a few documents with 57 mentions of symptoms, of, sorry, of, of side effects. And I would like to map this mentions to the, um, you know, the knowledge base. So what I do is I can then, I go here and I can label I can label them. So say, okay, I found here that, um, okay, my depression has been caused by it. So that's a side effect that was reported. And these are the most likely matches in my uh, taxonomy. So my taxonomy has 7,000 entries. So it's, um, you know, do it this manually would, would take a while because there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of entries here. So we do uh, here like a matching um, using just text similarity, uh, but it's, it's a way to very quickly be able to uh, label uh, in, for this problem. So moody, like anxious mood, for example, that would be a label. Depressed would also be, so yeah, people might say, I feel depression or I, I am depressed and both should match to the same entity. Cry is crying, sleep disruptions. Uh, don't you know what to say here, but um, anyway, normal sleep related. Uh, decreased appetite for loss of appetite and so on. So these are the types of NLP tasks today that are um, supported by um, data QA. Um, and yeah, so we're, We also have a, a commercial version of the product, um, which we're making changes to the UI. Some of these changes will also go to the open source, um, but yeah, the commercial uh, version of this product will have, you know, is hosted. It has things like user accounts, um, authentication. Uh, we support PDFs. Um, we have a machine learning module where you can train a machine learning based on your, you know, given your annotations. 
Um, so it has a lot more functionality than the open source. Um, so yeah, thank you. I don't know why I did this. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Um, so again, the, the open source link is there, data QA. Uh, we're looking for any feedback. We're looking for contributors as well. Um, anything, you know, this is the reason why I'm presenting today. Anything we, we, you can tell us about using this for your problem is really welcome. And of course, if you like it, stars again, very, very welcome. Um, I put my email there if you're interested in talking about anything you know about annotations for your projects uh we're really open for any discussion any way we could help you uh we're really happy to hear from you and uh, we also have a twitter account where we are going to tweet a bit more <laughs> about programmatic labeling few shot learning uh all you know all different ways that you can annotate today uh, much quicker uh yeah thank you Thank you so much, Maria. So we have time for some questions. The first one is, how does it compare to other data labeling tools like LightTech or Prodigy? Um, so I cannot speak so much about um, LightTech because I haven't used it. Um, but I think uh, the, the focus on, of this tool is really the programmatic labeling bit. So it's, it's, uh, it has a very advanced rule engine, which uh, I showed on the talk. So uh, I'm not sure how you would do this with other tools. So Prodigy, uh, I know that you can configure it um, to use it also like, you know, with uh, advanced rules. Um, but I think another difference is the, the no code. So data QA really is meant for, uh, you know, quick uh, data exploration has a search engine. Uh, you don't, there's, today we don't really support developer APIs or any integration with notebooks or anything like this. Whereas um, a tool like Prodigy has, I think, a different end user in mind. It's, it's really meant for uh, a Python developer. Uh, yeah, so I think that's the main, the main differences. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, what types of data does Data QA support, like images or PDFs? I guess you answered that already for PDFs by now. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's for text, so we don't do anything with images today. Um, but for text, we do, we can read PDFs. And um, so we would understand the different sections of the PDF. And uh, so, yeah, we would find um, paragraphs and you can, you can apply rules on a paragraph level, on a document level. Yep. Great. Mm, how do I deal with the selection bias induced by tools like search? Um, yeah, so selection bias, I think um, when you are labeling, you, you do have to follow certain principles. So for example, one important principle is to label. So let's say you have come up with some rules. Um, they will not cover your entire corpus most probably. So you do need to label uh, documents that have not been covered by the rules, you know, to understand something like recall, for example, um, or, you know, missed patterns. So that, that's definitely important. Um, so, and also you need to label examples of rules. So otherwise, if you train a machine learning program on, the, on these weak labels without having annotated any examples from those weak labels, it will not learn which rules are working and which ones are not. So uh, this is something that, yeah, I would like to add, um, to make it easier from the interface to annotate in a way that we do minimize the selection bias, but this is, this is work in progress. So we have time for one last question. What are your recommendations for labeling ambiguous cases? So, I mean, ambiguous cases, I think you do need to have, uh, either you have like an oracle, or I would say um, a person in your company that is the one that will be the final judge of these difficult cases, uh, or, um, you know, do a notator agreement type of uh, approach where you have multiple people look at the same uh, same example and use majority voting. I mean, I think those are the only approaches I know of. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I'd say uh, you can maybe connect on Discord and the Kuppelsaal channel afterwards if you want to. And thank you very much for the great talk. Thank you so much.